I'm Josh Cooperman, and this is Convo by Design, and today on the show, we have Kate Brown and her firm's creative director, New York fashion designer, Dean Sidaway. Kate and her namesake brand produce some beautiful garments for the home. Yes, this is a conversation about design, but it's also a chat about fashion, clothing for the home, if you will, and sustainability at the same time, upcycling and reimagining gently worn Chanel, Valentino, and Louis Vuitton into pillows and fashion for the home. It's an interesting concept if you really think about it. Tile, poles, hardware have long been called the jewelry for the home. We talk about our homes as living, breathing entities, so why shouldn't they be dressed? Why shouldn't textiles serve as fashion for the home? Partly rhetorical, partly not, and... That's the part Kate, Dean, and I discuss here. Convo by Design is more than just a podcast. I'm not sure if you know that. I have spent the past 10 years building a production company and consulting firm that develops brand ambassador programs, CEUs, live event programming, as well as branded content for companies in the design and architecture industry, including designers, architects, furnishing companies, showrooms, and others in the trade. We have content producer talent in every region of the country and can help you grow your design business through brand development campaigns, social media, and CEU content development and production, as well as content consulting and live event programming to help you build strong and meaningful partnerships that will help you grow and strengthen your design business. For more information, message me at Convo by Design with an X on Instagram or email me Convo by design at outlook.com. C O N V O B Y D E S I G N at outlook.com. Following is my chat with Kate and Dean. This is a new way to look at dressing your home and a beautiful home fashion brand. You'll hear all about it right after this. I am so incredibly proud of my partnership with Thermosol. They have been presenting partners of Convo by Design for three years now, and there is a certain amount of pride that comes from saying that the show is presented by the company that is the best in the world at what they do. I think Thermosol makes the greatest steam shower generators in the world for a few reasons. They were first to do it here in the United States, dating back to 1958. They operate a world-class factory here in the U.S. in Round Rock, Texas, where they have an engineering team that designs, tests, and continually refines the product. They test every single steam generator before it leaves the factory. Who else does that? Nobody. I have had the pleasure of working with some world-class designers and architects who tell me, and I, I think you know this, that the idea of luxury has changed, especially when clients want a spa-like bathroom. Steam is mandatory, or it's just not luxury. And if you want to add steam, you have one true option, the best in the biz, and that's Thermosol. Mitch Altman, third-generation CEO of this family-owned business, continues to innovate with Smart Shower, a technological marvel, aromatherapy, chromotherapy, and so many options. And it's easy to size and simple to configure. Check out all the available options at thermosol.com because a bathroom isn't truly luxury without steam, and there is really only one option if you want the best. It's Thermosol. Have you noticed that nowadays scheduling has become so much more complicated? than it used to be? Oh, God, yes. (laughs) You're singing my song, Josh. (laughs) Yes. Isn't it funny? It's funny, too, because even with Zoom, doing things virtually, it's funny, like, before the pandemic, everything that I did virtually was with, well, was via Skype. Yeah. And it was, it was super easy. I just didn't use it all that much, because I would much prefer to be in front of people. Yeah. And then, seemingly something that became so easy as doing a virtual on your phone or on your computer. Nowadays, we're so overly, we're just busier, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy (laughs) for sure. I I imagine too, I I imagine too that you are much busier, far busier than you used to be um, with things that you never really had to deal with before, like specifying and raw materials and delivery times and supply chain. Yeah, and, and managing client expectation. <laughs> so it's just, yeah, crazy. That That is a big part of, I think, most designers do. <laughs> Especially so nowadays, me, shipping delays. Do me a favor. Yeah. Let's start at the, be- start at the beginning. Um, I'm a sucker for a good origin story. 
tell me, tell me the story. Tell me the story, not the one that I'll read in the bio or that <laughs> I'll see in a magazine or that comes from your publicist, but I love Andrew, but not that one. Yeah, I got um, it. Tell me the real story. Yeah. So, and I'll kind of feather Dean into it as well. But so I'm obviously an interior designer. So that's my, that's my job of choice. And I really found that um, finding materials that were interesting and sexy, if you will, and fun were far and few between, to say the least, in terms of really cool upholstery fabrics are fine but they just don't have the interest and sort of sparkle and and sort of personality of some of the fashion fabrics and I am a lover of fashion and I sort of in my mind started marrying my fashion love and interest with my job and I really literally just started looking in my own closet and started going like I, I don't wear this. This is like a really beautiful Gucci, you know, embroidered jacket or whatever it was. And I would, and I, one day I, I just went to my seamstress and I went, Hey, is this a stupid idea? And I fully thought she was going to go, are you mental? Like we can't do that. What are you talking about? And I just sort of started laying out garments that were from my own closet and I started saying, I really love this detail. I'd love to marry it with this really beautiful black velvet from Maxwell or, you know, Beacon Hill or whatever. And, you know, what if we, you know, what if we put this detail down in front of the pillow? And what if we started, you know, maybe marrying in this little bit of a satin from the lining of a jacket and put that as a little trim? It kind of just started very organically with me just kind of going, hey, I'd really love to repurpose some of these fabrics. And I was doing that with my own wardrobe, like literally taking sleeves off a jacket that I didn't like anymore and adding it to a jacket that I did like and then kind of making that personality come to life through changing of my clothes which made sense for me because then I wasn't you know getting rid of stuff I was making it something that I'd actually wear and like so I just sort of brought that into my design world and I I sort of made a couple of clients my guinea pigs <laughs> and threw them into some some of my jobs and I couldn't believe the feedback from people just loving the you know loving the style loving the look loving the feel it's so original and so um so, just so unique and beautiful and from there other designers were seeing some of the stuff I was making and I mean, I had designers say to me, where have you been all my life? Like, where have these pillows been? So I just started making more and more. And then my very dear friend, Dean, who's a sustainable uh, fashion designer in New York, amazing designer. Um, we just started going to like housing works and all these incredible thrift stores in New York, which you can imagine are phenomenal. And we started finding, you know, Armani jackets and Gucci sweaters and Prada, you know, all these incredible garments. And we just started falling in love with all the details. And we would literally bring them back to my apartment in New York and throw them on the table and start like, you know, deconstructing and figuring out how we could make this into a pillow. And then I reached out to a seamstress in New York who sewed for Louis Vuitton and high end fashion houses. And, and Thankfully, he was interested in working with me, which to, to this day, I joke, I don't know why he did. <laughs> we, we, met, uh, we met in Union Square, sat on, a, sat on a park bench, and I threw stuff out and went, this is what I want to do, and I want to do it in a bigger volume. And so finish the thought, technology, am I right? So finish, <laughs> finish the thought. So, you know, I, I, I met up, with with this incredible seamstress we sat on a park bench in, in at union square and i pulled out all the the garments and the ideas and my sketches and excitement and and he thankfully and that was three years ago thankfully said i'm in i'll i'll help you out i'll do it and the level of refinement and detail and thoughtfulness that he brought to the product was mind-boggling because he's just got I, such incredible skill and detail i have a side note and it's really ah. stupid so so i'm just <laughs> going to get it out of my head shouldn't a male be a seamster 
And wouldn't it be cool to be a seamster? I always do that. No, I always do. And everyone <laughs> says that's wrong. What Now, what do you think? Um, I don't know. When you, I mean, because I know him, so I kind of figured I knew who you were talking about. Um, I've never really thought about I, it. I knew <laughs> yeah, that. Sorry. Look, look. I, sorry. Look, and you know what? To be honest with you, it doesn't even really matter. I just, it's one I, of those things where it's like, should totally be a seamster. It would be I, a cooler I, thing I too. Like that. Uh, yeah, I, I, I've tried to, because I remember having that conversation with Lasha and I was like, so is it, I don't want to say seamstress when I, when I refer to you. And he laughed. He goes, oh no, that's what everyone refers as. And I went, but, but, but here's, I but here's, word. But here's the idea where, where I'm kind of going with that too. And, and Dean, I want your take on this. You know, fashion, the way that I've always seen it has, has always been such a, uh, a matriarchy, right? Mm-hmm. And design and architecture has always been a patriarchy. And design has always kind of been a free flow. I think, I think it's shifted over the years. But what I think is really interesting is where, Kate, where you're going with this, and, and Dean, I want your take on this. It's really interesting to me, too, because there has always been a huge influence on interior design through fashion and travel, oh, right? Wow. And I, I feel like you've always been able to get away with so much more in fashion because it's been so much more experimental. Yeah. And I'm curious... Dean, do you feel that way in your creations? And do you have to flip a switch, feminine, male side, w- when shifting your ideas between fashion and design? Um, I would, I mean, I would say, just to come to your first point in regards to sort of the fashion and the matriarchy, like I actually, I would disagree, I think, because it's always, it's very, it has always been very sort of like male dominated. Obviously you have like Coco Chanel, you have Madame Grasse, you have these amazing female designers, like women that women sort of designs. And even now you've got Phoebe Philo, you know, who's sort of regenerated uh, Celine. Um, so I think it's, but I do think it's always been, it, it's always been very male driven. The sort of the male dominating designers have always been Karl Lagerfeld, Yves Saint Laurent, Marc Jacobs, you know, so it's always kind of very male driven, but I think coming to your point about flipping a switch for that, I actually not like I don't. I, I trained in women's wear design, so and that's kind of my love. That's you know where I sort of where I come from. Um, but I think that again, where we're going right now in terms of you, obviously when you sort of look at high stores, it's still very sort of like you know male, like you know the men's wear section, the women's wear section, and people the, the sort of mass consumers do want to know where to go but I think sort of generationally like things are changing I teach also and so there is there is for over many years now there's been a long um a real adjustment to sort of like the idea of genderless design and that it isn't specifically for men or women it's just design and I think I do maybe because I'm surrounded by like 21 year olds or you know (laughs) um I do take that on in my own approach as well. You know, uh, the, the collection that I do and when I'm working with Kate also isn't specifically geared towards, well, that would work on a woman or that would work on a man. It's just kind of like hopefully just a beautiful garment or a beautiful application of design. Mm-hmm. Mm. I think when I, when I talk about a matriarchy in design, uh, in, sorry, in fashion, I'm not specifically talking about the creators but for whom it's the being makers. designed. Not the makers, but for whom it's being designed. And mm-hmm. in interiors, so- Oh, you know, I understand. Because fashion is always female first. It, uh, it always has been, uh, in my yeah. personal opinion. I, I think that you know, there's definitely male design, but what's interesting to me is in, in fashion rather, in interior design, it's really interesting to me because you've always sort of had this blend between um, male oriented design, female oriented design. I found this, um, I found this video. It was a Westinghouse video from the 1950s about the, the, um, the future electric home, you know, they're trying to sell electricity, right? So they create this whole movie with Betty Furness about the electric home and it was really interesting to get a perspective of how ideas really work. Look, I was a, I was a teen 
in the 1980s in Los Angeles. So I didn't get a real good perspective of what the 50s were like. But where they're talking about, and the woman of the house is going to love this kitchen. Yeah. And yeah. the man of the house is going to love, you know, the automated. I mean, they just yeah. totally broke it down by gender lines. I bring yeah. it up. I bring it up because I think it's really interesting. And, I, and I'm looking at some of the, some of the, um, the pillows and I, and I love it. And I, I think what's really interesting, too, is your perspective on the lasting of it, the the elongated, like if you can get a vintage Givenchy, right, and you can turn that into something, that's classic. That is going to last forever. That is not ephemeral in any way, shape, or form. But even fashion spent all this time, you know, this whole fast fashion concept Mm -hmm. that designed, because fashion influences interiors and interior design, that idea of fast fashion where things don't have to be permanent kind of went in well, and now it's going back the other way. I'm curious how you as a, you know, as both fashion designer, interior designer, how you view that and, and how that changes the way that you do the work. That's a good question. Do you want to answer that or do you want me to? You I'll start. <laughs> um, what I really liked and thought it was such a bang on comment about um, fast fashion's influence on fashion in general. I mean, Dean and I speak about this quite a bit, that if you remember back in the day, there were four fashion seasons, right? There were four. Do you know how many there are now? 52. No. But 52 micro seasons pushed by fast fashion so that people will buy more and, and get rid of more. I mean, think about back in the day when... Um, you think about, it's not even really back in the day, you think about how how people were sort of almost shunned. Like you think about in Hollywood, if you wore the same gown twice. Now, thankfully, I start to see a turn where people are being applauded for wearing, you know, if a, a celebrity is wearing the same something on a on another red carpet or, you know, it's, it's I, I really hope and feel like I'm seeing that changing about that, you know, repurposing and, and reusing it and, and valuing something so that it can be kept going forward. And I think, it, it, you know, the way that that fast fashion has influenced in home interiors is seen at a number of, uh, I won't name them, stores that sort of, um, well, actually I will name one, H&M is a good example because they're doing the fashion and they realize we can do that same puking up the crap in the house too. We can not just puke on what you wear. You can also have it in your house. So you go into H&M and there's the homewares with all that nightmare stuff, but still it looks, you know, it's really mimicking what's in fashion in the home. And obviously like their clothes are mimicking what's in fashion for the higher end, you know, higher end garments. So I feel like it's definitely bled in and they're definitely leading the way in terms of how, that you know that fast fabrication and whatnot is really affecting home home interiors help me out help me understand something so so kate you're an interior designer correct yeah and you and dean you're a fashion designer so you work on the fashion side do dean do you work on the interior side as well i don't actually no, I have a I have an interest um, in interiors, but I haven't other than my own home. No, <laughs> never done anything, and I don't work with Kate on yeah. projects for that either. He only works on the Kate Brown Studio stuff, so he's the the creative director in terms of the fashion and how we create the products for the home. So technically, you kind of work on the home stuff because you're helping well, with the design the, yeah. of the pillow. So, well, I, I'm asking. Specifically, you know, it, it's funny when I when I have these conversations, it, you know, having done so many <laughs> over the years, yeah. and each one is and each one is so different. And I'm reminded of certain stories. You know, when you're talking about fast fashion, and you know, I'm reminded of something that happened recently. Um, there were a couple of episodes that I did on 1001 North Roxbury, which is a um, it's a mansion in Beverly Hills on, yep. North, on Roxbury and yep. it's being, it, it's getting ready to be demolished. 
And um, North Roxbury is probably one of, if not the most famous street in Beverly Hills outside of Rodeo, right? Yeah. And yeah. it's Eric Baker and his, and his wife, Dr. Baker, who, are, who bought the house, bought it with the intent to demolish it. And they went through the process of demolishing it. Now, they paid $39 million for the property. The yeah. property was in Architectural Digest. The property, yeah. you know, it was in it was in Lux. It's not a it's not a teardown. Yeah, it is. It is a stunning example of Hollywood Regency architecture and design. It was yeah. designed um, impeccably. Yeah. It got me thinking in advance of this because I, I know that you know part of what what you do and you talk about sustainability and design and we're having this conversation about fast fashion and fast design and money is is no indicator of good taste or uh -huh. or, or <laughs> sustainability and feelings yeah. about but to take a ten thousand square foot property home demolish it put all the contents in a in a landfill so that you can build something else which arguably isn't not only isn't it going to be any better but it's not going to have the provenance to it it's not going to have i'm i want to know your take on sort of how you feel about this and dean i asked if you two work together on the interior side because i feel like the influences of fashion and travel um are are so inextricably tied together and that is where we're going in, I think design is in a renaissance mm -hmm. right now. And it, and Kate, in your work, um, I kind of feel like you, you take that on a little bit. And I'm curious your feelings on that and how it's affecting your work now and potentially in the future. That's a really good question. So I, I did hear about that house because um, I'm originally from California. Uh, and it, I, I have to say the only word I can think of was I was heartbroken. Uh, I just was shocked that it wasn't a protected site, a uh, historical site. Um, it was really sad to know that money can just come in and do things like that. And yeah, it's heart, it's heartbreakingly sad. And I think it, you know, will, will be something that the community around it regrets and maybe even the owners at some point will have a wake up call and regret doing that. I just think it's really tragic and it's, unfortunately a signal of what money can do and the lack of care of sustainability having like you said having money but it's really speak to a care of sustainability and caring for it's not so people. it's not so much that it's not so much that and i and i totally get that i feel the same way that, that you do i'm just curious though because you've you haven't, you've kind of done something about it, you know, whether it's Hermes or Givenchy yeah. or, or Tom Ford, yeah. you've actually taken these things and instead of jettisoning them or getting rid of them, you found a way to creatively repurpose them to now they have a separate life doing something else. I, I just, yeah. I, I have to believe that in something like interior design and architecture of which you are in this as well, mm -hmm. that there are ways in which or rather, I'm curious how you're incorporating those ideas in your interior design. Oh, okay, gotcha. Well, we do that with every single project. Um, we are always about trying to repurpose what a client will have. We always have the conversation with them about, you know, ways that they can modify and change what they have versus just ripping it all out. Because we are we are living in a society where everything is built to be replaced quickly. I mean, I just feel like even, for example, a, you know, a washing machine that was built two years ago versus a washing machine that was built 25 years ago, they're not comparable. I mean, they're, I mean that old washing machine is going to last forever, whereas something built a few years ago is just not built to last. So I do always have that conversation with clients to try to ensure that they think it through in terms of ways that they can you know if it's an old bench painted or maybe we add an upholstered seat or we do try very hard to work with clients to try to repro you know if they're looking at getting their kitchen maybe there's a way that we can save the boxes repaint the doors or have the doors remade or you know ways to work with them so that they're not having to replace every single thing in the house we really do try to recover furniture pieces you know, value things that they have. And, but it's also about teaching people to value things they have, because I think we've been trained like monkeys to 
just get rid of everything as quick. You know, it just nothing matters. You know, we just you can buy something. Uh, the price is lower, so we feel like we should buy more. It's like a it's a mentality, right? Rather than buying one really good handbag, for example, will you know people will buy four or five cheaper, and then they don't last, and then you're getting rid of those four or five. But if you just bought that one good piece, it, you'd still have it today. And I think that's a lesson that I really hope people start to learn is to buy better, repurpose, value, and reinvent what luxury is. I mean, that was one of the conversations I had with Harrods was they're having such a hard time finding product that is luxurious and sustainable. That marriage is very hard to find and, and something that doesn't feel like a compromise. And I think the luxury buyer, whether it's in fashion or in interior design, doesn't want to feel like they have to compromise. And I go back to your story about the Beverly Hills house. That person just had a mindset of not wanting to compromise on exactly what they wanted. And I feel like if we can offer sustainable solutions that don't feel like a compromise and they tick the boxes of what people want, then I think that's really important. And when I, you know, started uh, that dialogue with Harrods, that was one of the things that they really thought was important is being able to tick those boxes because a lot of sustainable product, people just kind of go, no, I, I want to stick with what I know, or, you know, I want this because it's more luxurious. I don't care about the sustainable side. So you're really battling these two things that you want to be a luxury product, but you also want to show people that, sustainability can be luxury you can live well and 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 you know do well and live well at the same time right do good while while doing something nice for the for the planet and i think that's critically important yeah it's interesting too um there's a quote on your on your website from the ellen macarthur foundation waste is a design flaw which yeah. i think is just I, I think it's just absolutely genius i totally agree i'm curious though um, back to the the pillows and the the fashion side of this. Yeah. Tell me about tell me about procurement because I would imagine that's probably a pretty big challenge. Yeah. Well, we go we do like whenever I'm with Kate and separately as well. We'll go to like you know thrift stores and whatever and try and find like pieces. Um, but then also just kind of like sourcing online that whether there's things that the real real is a great source for us. Yeah, and the things that have been like, you know, there's damages on things so that you know, things won't actually want to be worn, or maybe they're in like a sort of size zero or you know, the other the other end of the spectrum. And so those things are sort of just like left, you know, and they they become further and yeah. further reduced. But the pieces that I'm the most interested in are the things that sort of do have faults in them and that have like, you know, that need repair. And so you can sort of deconstruct those pieces to then utilize them for like home furnishing. It's like a rescue do shelter you, for garments. <laughs> it's like a rescue shelter for garments. Do you, but I, I would imagine too, because it's so limited in scope as far as what you're looking for. And then you have to you have to try to maintain the consistency of it. It seems like a very challenging way to to do a store, but it also seems like an incredibly op an incredible opportunity for for a brand like this. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the the pieces are also limited, and obviously they're limited because of the sort of the sourcing of the garment. So there will only ever be yeah. two of one particular garment, depending on the size, you know, like and how. We kind of repurpose it. Yeah, I mean, know, I there think. are certain garments, you know, like I'll give an example. There's a Tom Ford cream and black leather uh, garment that we were able to get quite a lot of it. So we did a line for Selfridges in the UK um, that's exclusive to them, but there were probably, we were able to make, I, don't, I think, about 10 of them. But then when it's done, it's done. Like I almost want to limit runs because. I want that exclusivity. I think that is part of part of it. And there's so many other designs that we can be doing. I mean, we can do custom designs for people because people will come to me that have, you know, example, an old Chanel jacket in their closet from their grandmother that they don't fit or it's not their style, whatever the case may be. But it's stunning, incredible Chanel Beaucle wool or whatever the case may be. And they, you know, they can make the most incredible pillow because with that, we, we mix it with 
remnants. I mean, we go to Mood and different places in New York and we get a lot of offcuts and remnants and dead stock. And that's what we back our fabrics with too. And even buying old, we, we did a um, project with New York Cares uh, and we bought up old leather jackets, black leather jackets, and we had paint artists in New York paint on them and mix them with like linen garments. And so the linen and the black leather became like the canvases and they were these big 24 by 24 pillows and the proceeds went to New York Cares during the pandemic. So it was a really fun project and it's, those again were limited because they were done by local New York artists. So we know when they're gone, they're gone. And that's kind of our mentality that, you know, you might love a, a, a Chanel pillow that we do, but then you're going to see another one that's very similar, but you know, it's a different Navy Beaucle jacket or it's a different Louis Vuitton, you know, skirt or made from. So we do have sort of styles that we like in terms of how we design the pillows, but we don't want to limit ourselves. We sort of let the garments find us in a way. And we do a very sort of cheeky fun line with Moschino and Jeremy Scott. and They're off the charts fun. And then we'll do very, sort of, I don't know what the word would be, but very sort of classic high-end luxury pillows that would be the Chanel, the Louis Vuitton, the Givenchy, you know, Tom Ford, things like that. So we kind of, and then we have a designer line that's kind of down the middle, you know, whether it's Kenzo, Mark Jacobs, we sort of have the three tiers that that we do, but there's also, you know, some of the, some of the basic ones that we do are just fabulous mystery garments that we found at housing works in Chelsea that are just unbelievable. We have no idea who the designer is, but it's probably from the fifties or sixties, but the wool is just incredible. And some, you know, some gal on the Upper East side sent it off to housing works and we were the better for it. You know, we, it, it, it's something that we treasure and we've made incredible pillows out of it or mixed it maybe with a Gucci leather or something and made something really spectacular out of it. So. It's a lot of fun. It's actually probably the most creative thing I've done. And I'm, you know, working in design, interior design world. And I still think there's nothing more rewarding and creative than creating things. It's just a ton of fun. I, I love that too. Um, it, limited experience. The, the one thing I can relate to this is uh, for years, um, I was working with set decorators. One of the other things I love to do is talk to set decks and just yeah. talk to them about that whole procurement process about, you know, they're not designing for a client, right? They're designing for a script. So yeah. there's so much more leeway it's as so far fun. as how- I've got a good set deck and it's fun. Yeah, it's fun. And so um, for years I was working with Warner Brothers and I don't know if you've ever done this, but, um, and it's been years since I've talked about it, but Warner Brothers- has their prop house in, in Burbank, California. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, it's the size of a football field stacked yeah. five high. It's oh, yeah. amazing. And the things you'll see there are just stunning. Well, one of the things, oh. one of the floors is their um, fabric and, um, you know, where they, where they make everything. And they, when I was getting a tour once, they were showing me just these literally hundreds and hundreds of bolts of fabric that have been there since the early 1900s, you know, where if, if no set decorator picks them out or nobody specifies to use it, it's just going to kind of sit there. And it was amazing to look at some of these things. And I I would imagine that for you, it's kind of similar. The, the process of trying to find these things has to be fun. You're listening to a conversation about home fashion with Kate Brown and Dean Sidaway. We'll be right back. We are living in a time of incredible growth, both technologically and creatively, with respect to interior design, exterior design, and architecture. There is no question. There are companies thinking differently about the business of design and how to make products super serve those for whom they're being made. One of those companies, and one of my favorites, is Moya Living, designer and fabricators of some of the most stunningly beautiful, incredibly durable, and highly functional kitchen, bath, and outdoor kitchen cabinetry on the market today. Powder-coated steel with stunning lines, vibrant colors to fit any design style or aesthetic. A history of designing cabinetry for the scientific community, so you know it's been tested in some of the truly 
the most harsh conditions available. Moya O'Neill is the CEO and founder of Moya Living. She's the inspiration behind the design. Designers, their specification process is so simple. It will make your job so much easier. Check them out online through the socials at Moya Living, their website, moyaliving.com, and in the real world, their live kitchen showroom in Fountain Valley, California. Yeah, just sort of recapping, it's, it, you know, they had bolts from the, from the, the early 1900s through, because if no one specified it, if no one picked it for a project um, yeah. to have them work on something, it just sort of sat, which is, which is really interesting. I would imagine that the specifying and procurement and discovery process has to be some of the most fun. Yeah, oh, there's no doubt, especially in New York City. I mean, the, the, the amount of product that we are, you know, we can find there and the uniqueness. And for me, too, it's, it's always had a sort of a backstory of the or a, a history of the story of the garment. I've always thought that was the funnest part, you know, because when you find something in the Upper East Side at an old thrift store and you know it's, it's some, you know, Chanel boucle wool jacket or whatever it is and you think what history did this piece have you know like where did it come from who left you know who brought it here and where what parties did it go to you know who did it rub shoulders <laughs> you know because high-end garments in New York City have probably a more interesting lives than all three of us put together <laughs> like you know like I, I really believe that that it's kind of fun to just imagine what who wore it where and and sort of the history and I love the thought of something that's been discarded bringing back into the forefront and being brought to brought to life in a new in a new purpose and new beauty we have we did a story once that was about um a couple of pillows that we did that were just a um it was a kind of a rags to riches story because it was a garment that we found at a, a, a in a thrift store in New York. We had them remade into these gorgeous pillows. And to this day, they sit looking out the window on Park Avenue yeah. at the most spectacular view in New York. And we kind of laughed that it was the story of them being rescued and then made into these beautiful pillows. And now they're in this super high-end luxury apartment on Park Avenue. And it's kind of a neat, it's kind of a neat way to think about something, right? And that sort of got our our, our ideas going about making making more like that to kind of have a new life and, and get repurposed. Well, let's, let's talk, let's talk about that new life for, for a second and sort of the, the business side of this. So how do you get noticed outside of New York? Right. So how do you, how do you expand this is more of a branding question really, yeah. but because, because fashion is global, you know, interior yeah. design is global and some of what you're working you know, working with, you know, your publicity, that's one thing, but yeah. how, how do you also, how do you get noticed? How do you, how do you, how do you share the message? Uh, well, I mean, obviously we use our Instagram account, but we, to, we on, honestly have so much word of mouth through interior designers that, you know, one interior designer that's working in New York might have a client in LA you know, and then they're showing it to designers. And then we get emails from designers in LA where we obviously work between Vancouver and New York. So we have, it, I would say our biggest fan are, um, our biggest fan are our interior designers and they end up, you know, talking to their clients there, you know, they talk to other interior designers. I'd say that's the biggest way we get the word out. And then obviously working with companies like Selfridges, we're going to be doing a, um, collaboration with Lindley in London. We're working with Liberties of London. Uh, hopefully we're going to have something with Harvey Nichols soon. And obviously we're in talks with Harrods as well and selling itself. So those types of stores elevate your brand, obviously. And some of the um, retailers that we deal with out in the Hamptons and places like that. And Maison 10 in New York City has been a huge advocate for our brand. Hey, Dean. Um... Are there any, for you, are there any fabrics that are just like holy grails for you that you're like, man, if I could, <laughs> if I, if I could find this, what do you look, what do you, what is like on that list for you? 
fabric well, I mean like like a a double face like cashmere is always like amazing to find um but that doesn't necessarily work for pillows because the idea is that you know it's so soft on the skin um I I tend to be like just about textures and color and it's all when Kate was mentioning something before it made me like the excitement is in the possibility of what you can do with something um so in terms of in terms of design for the body, I'm all about like cashmere's and silks and you know all those like really beautiful feeling fabrics. And the pillows are the same. You still want that kind of. Um... He goes nuts for an, an Alexander McQueen. Let me tell you. <laughs> Let me you tell get, you. <laughs> um, but you've got like you know there's you want something that's going to feel good. You know as well as look good, you want it to kind of like feel good. If you're using a pillow, you know so. So I, do, I think the, the ones that, that excite me the most for that would actually be the sort of really soft textured ones, you know, anything that has, that, that would have like a silk content in it or like, you know, something that, that just sits well against the skin. And that's funny that you say that too, because so many of our clients have said to us, these pillows feel like nothing, else, no other upholstery fabric that we've ever, no other pillow, no other upholstery that we've ever had. We had a client that came into our studio and ordered 26 pillows. Uh, I mean, from Chanel to Givenchy. And she said, I just want them all over the house because they, everywhere I sit, the, just the touch and the feel is so soft. And so, you know, we're really cognizant of that too, making sure, I think it's because of Dean, making sure that it's touchable and it feels really nice. Like even our leathers that we use are when we're buying the leather jackets and things like that, the old vintage jackets are very worn and very soft and very supple. And I always think it's like the skin test. It has to pass mm -hmm. the skin test. <laughs> I love that. And listen, I, I love the pillows. I think they're fantastic. And I love what you're doing. Um, for those who are listening, who are interested in following along, check the show notes. There will be links uh, to the websites. You can learn more uh, about Kate and Dean and uh, and the firm and the pillows and the whole thing. Um, I love it. Thank you so much for the time today. This was fun. Oh, we had a great time. Thank you so much for the time, Josh. Thank you. It's a pleasure to meet you. Nice meeting you. Bye-bye. Hang, hang on one second for the show. Um, Kate, how many how many projects on average are you working on a month now? Interior design projects? Yeah. Or yeah. Build projects. Um, I have a month. Right now I'm I've got six in New York and eleven in Vancouver. Is and that the whole firm or, or just you? That is me and we have uh, three others that work in my office for me in Vancouver. And then I have one person that works for me in New York. So that's between, that's for the firm. Those are our projects. But I, just because of my personality, I have, I have my hand in every project. And oftentimes because I'm the, the name on the company, the clients want me involved in every, so you know what it's like, like you're, you end up being more involved in every project than you ever thought you would be, but. Yeah. yeah, so very deeply design firm, and then we've got the studio as well. Um, what are you seeing as far as budgets um, um, on your on behalf of your clients right now? As far as you know, not necessarily specifics for room or for for home, but are you seeing are you seeing their budgets going up? Are you seeing them contract? What have you seen? Uh, but budgets going up. Um, I would say begrudgingly. I don't think people want the price to go up. But they don't really have any choice. And my um, my motto right now is I don't make it and I don't ship it when it comes to the design part of it, you know, in terms of interior design, what we're buying. Because you know as well as I do that we have no control over shipping right now. It's a gong show. Prices are going up. You know, suppliers are, are raising prices sometimes weekly. <laughs> You, and and you've got trades that the, the prices are going up on a regular basis and there's there's shipping issues, costs are going up in shipping. So there's so many delays that costs money. Like we're just in a point with our clients and we'll say, if you want to renovate right now, it's the wild west. So are you, in, are you still, open, are you still seeing shipping costs go up? Um, I would say they're getting a little bit better now, but when I look at the projects that I'm working on and when they started, 
the cost of gas, the cost, the, the length of you know, shipping times have gone up since some of the projects started. So I think that it's just kind of a come to Jesus moment with clients about pricing right now and, and just product pricing. I mean, it's, 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 it's high. I mean, I work in Vancouver and New York and two, one of the, you know, probably the, the top 10 in terms of, you know, in the top 10 of most expensive cities in North America. So, you know, I do have a little bit of a, an edgy side for that, obviously, but I'm, but they're expensive cities to work in in general. So I'm cognizant of that fact with my clients. Have you raised, have you raised your rate as a result? I haven't raised my rate this year. Um, but I definitely will be in 2023. Yeah. Do you know how you're going to, Oh, sorry. So we, we do an hourly rate with our clients. And then we take, and then if we're doing the, we do design build. So if we're doing the build, we also have a, a 15% charge on whatever we're, whatever we're building or whatever we're managing. Um, I don't think my management rate will go up because it, it's probably where it should be, but our, our rates will go up in 2020. Do you, do you, so you, you have, you have rate um, percentage on build and then commission on product? We do, we do uh, our fees it, and then whatever product we're purchasing, we have our commission on that. And then we also have our uh, build percentage. So when, our, when we're building a building, say doing a renovation where it's a build of a kitchen or something, if it's 35,000, we have our percentage on that. And then if we're buying furniture for the living room or whatever, that kind of thing, then we have our commission on that. And then our fees for start out we wait for our time. And then this is sort of a two-part question because you're also yeah. a product manufacturer as well as um, what do you need from showrooms right now from a service standpoint? And, and then also as a brand and a, and a supplier of product, um, what do you need from them on that side too? Well, it's actually funny. If I, I have to say what's really low, if I'm understanding the question right in terms of what is hard for me to get right now or and getting more expensive, more difficult. I'm actually going in the UK now are um, the inserts, good quality pillow inserts are becoming quite yeah. difficult right now. So that's something that we're literally stockpiling because the price is going to continue to go up for, for good because we buy sustainable down pillows. So, yeah. so that's more difficult to get um, in terms of in a showroom, what's, What's hard? I mean, I'm sure you know this. I'll use RH for an example. I think the wait time for an RH sofa right now is about eight months, which is <laughs> it's a sofa from a from a from a, from a from a service standpoint. Do the showrooms are the showrooms giving you the the kind of service that you need so that you can do your what you need to do? I would say. And I speak for what I've heard from a few designers lately. Um, the service levels have definitely gone down in studios, and I, I think it's probably, um, I think it's probably staffing issues. I've also yeah. heard I heard from a studio the other day where they were just they had a staffer that quit because they were absolutely being berated on a daily basis from from clients and customers that were just, it was unacceptable how long they were waiting and this and that. And I heard from, from the showroom manager that she was just tired of going home in tears every night. It's just couldn't take the stress of dealing with because people are so, I hate to say this, but self-involved, self-centered, mm -hmm. it's all about them and why, you know, they don't even think about what's going on in the world. They go, well, why is my self taking so long? Like, and I'm always like, do you think I'm making it in my basement in my gaunch? Like, what, what, what are you crazy? Like, I have no control over when your soap is going to come. Like, but think about all the little factors that play into how long it takes to get things and just have some patience and think about the rest of the people in the world and what's going on and simmer down. Like, I, I just have no tolerance for that right now. And I think a lot of designers and contractors are finding themselves in the same position where they're just so tired of how selfish people can be about just the world right now and the, the first world problems that they that they have and I, and I that's a really good example of that showroom that that poor girl is saying okay I'm not doing this job anymore like I just tired of going home at night crying and I just 
I thought that that tracks. That's how people are right now. It's yeah. crazy. Yeah. Rude yeah. and no no patience, no understanding, no empathy. It's just, yeah. Yeah. It's a tough business right, right now for sure. It's not for the week apart right now, that's for sure. <laughs> Design Hardware's newly remodeled showroom is where you will find a gallery-style space with a thoughtful display of products, purposefully positioned to allow unbridled exploration and discovery. High-end faucets, luxury tile, natural stone, wood floors, and bespoke hardware selections are presented in a holistic manner, strategically arranged to stimulate creativity and transition your vision from the conceptual stage to a fully realized space. Conveniently located, free parking available, stop by to find your inspiration, Collect samples, get expert advice, and tackle everything on your shopping list all in one place. Visit them online at designhardware.com or in the real world, 6053 West 3rd Street in Los Angeles. Thank you, Kate and Dean, for taking the time to share your story. Thank you, Convo by Design Partners and Sponsors, Thermosol, Moya Living, and Design Hardware for your continued support. And thank you for taking the time every week to share some time together and hear the stories behind Sublime Design. Check the show notes for links to Kate Brown, our social media links, and please keep emailing me with your suggestions uh, and guest submissions. I love them. Convo by design at outlook.com. Message me on Instagram, convo by design with an X. Until next week, remember why you do what you do and for whom you do it. Be well and take today first. (laughs) 